disruptors and curious minds. Welcome to Thinking on Paper, your personal guide to the impact of emerging technology on business and culture. And this is Book Club. Um, I'm Mark, this is Jeremy. Every week we read the chapter of a book in detail to get under the skin, to to expand our minds, to, to when we read a book, when you read a book, you kind of approach it from your own mental models, your own interpretations, your own biases. We're doing this to to break down the walls of the echo chamber and get more from our books. So if that sounds like something for you, subscribe, like, share. We need more people thinking on paper. And on that note, chapter seven of the design of everyday things by Don Norman. Design in the world of business. Jeremy, first thoughts. Design in the world of business is uh, another B word comes to the uh, comes to the forefront is balance. Um, And, you know, when you when you're designing something, there comes a point where you're like, okay, we got to pay for all this work and we got to sell something. We got to make something work. And, um, you know, that then comes in, you know, how do we how do we produce it for a cost below what we can sell it for and, and all of that stuff. So it takes a lot of this you know, fun, art, big thinking side of design and tries to kind of land it. Um, You know, this, I mean, the first sentence of the chapter, I mean, kind of hits the nail on the head. The realities of the world impose severe constraints upon the design of products. Like right, right off the top is just trying to make, trying to make something that uh, will sell, right? Is where, you know, what a successful product is outside of the realm of, uh, product designers who are super passionate about great products because there are great experiences that don't scale but i'm sure there are people out there like this is the best experience ever why is it not selling yeah i i i i liked this chapter we touched on it last week when we put on our cynical heads and we were saying yeah it's all great having human-centered design but you know you got to shift products and you got the bottom line is what counts and i like this chapter because it was pretty honest um and it touched upon some of the things we speak about in the show as well, like tech for tech's sake drives innovation um, and adding features drives innovation. And he speaks about kind of incremental and radical innovation in products. And But he always comes back. And I, this chapter is very different to the chapters because this was a much more human, cultural, psychological investigation of kind of what drives business. And it ain't always good design. Um, so, you know, I liked, I like this chapter. I like to, um, you know, having, having something, uh, this, this, this is talked about in a lot of innovation books, but the idea of something being designed or concepted at the same time, you know, being in the zeitgeist, so to speak, the spirit of the time being in the air, um, you know, TV television was designed by arguably designed by like four groups or four people simultaneously across the world. Right. And it got me thinking this good friend of mine a long time ago talked about having, having a clear antenna, right? Right. Okay. Because if your antenna is clear, you can pick up the signals that are out there, not just for what you want to do with your life, but like product design and like, what does the world need and what do humans need? And, and if your antenna is covered up with noise and, and Twitter, um, you're not going to be able to make new products. That's so good. That works for creativity as well. I think of that of like being able to listen to the whispers of the universe. You know, yeah. hear the whispers and that's what um, helps with many things. Um, question on the zeitgeist. Can you think of any, he, he speaks about the zeitgeist and how sometimes a product kind of materializes from what's needed at that time. Can you think of any immediate examples of that? Um, well, the, well, the television is one, you know, the, the, the telephone is another Elijah Gray and Alexander Graham Bell, you know, kind of came up with the same kind of thing right around the same time in very different parts of the world. Um, you know, and, and, you know, Alexander Graham Bell largely gets credit if you're in a second grade class, that's, uh, that's learning about that. Right. But, you know, it's like all of these people figure out little pieces that make, uh, the end result work really well. And it talks about like the two types, uh, two types of design, like incremental and radical, right? Yeah. You know, and, and we've talked about this a bunch is, you know, creativity in and of itself is the, the, the unique rearrangement of found elements. I mean, 
playing guitar, Mark. Like when you play guitar and like you're you're playing a metal song that you love, and then that sparks like you to write a little riff, and you're like, where did that come from? Well, that sounds a little Ramones. That sounds a little Slayer. Like you know, it's not it's not stealing. It's like it's the inspiration kind of carries into how you apply it. Okay, if you want to carry on that music analogy with like incremental innovation and radical innovation, could you? with music obviously it's it, so punk was a radical innovation whereas maybe uh baroque was an incremental or no it, how would you think about it with a music analogy yeah i mean you know hip-hop was pretty radical you know basically taken and literally it's the definition of what i call creativity the unique rearrangement of found elements there are sounds and samples that are repurposed i mean bob james the most sampled person on the planet you know, from his jazz records are like the key building blocks of hip hop. Who would have ever thought that, right? Yeah, Take, taking what came before and like reimagining it completely differently to how it came. Um, he doesn't mention this, but I want to ask you your thoughts on because a lot of the book is talking about like features for features shake, add, 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 rather than just creating something that people want or need. It's just add, got to keep up with the competition. Talk to me about planned obsolescence, because I think that planned obsolescence should be fucking illegal if it isn't, because uh, uh, he kind of hints at some of the underpinnings of planned obsolescence here. He doesn't just say, you know, all the big tech companies are, are fleecing us. But, you know, if you read between the lines, that's what I read. How do you, yeah. Yeah, it's annoying. It's flat out annoying as shit. Like, <laughs> you know, it, and and one of the one of the things, too, that I, that I think about is like, you know, once you have a good product, the first thing that you think about is like, all right, what can we do to add to it versus what about just sustaining an awesome product that doesn't need to change? What about incentivizing that? Like, and that also comes from customers, right? Do, do we as customers, we, we have something we're like, oh man, I wish it did this. All right. Then we go back to the product designer in like a, on a Reddit thread that someone's monitoring. They're like, well, we need, we've got pressure from the market. We need to do something else. And, you know, what if, what if we were, what if there was a way to incentivize pro like not innovating a product that's amazing? Um, yeah, it's just, just, it's, it's fine as it is. You don't need like that forever onwards for here evermore. You don't need to change it because it is as good as it's going to get. What's an example in your in your ecosystem? This is putting you on the spot. What's a product that you wouldn't have or don't think needs to ever change? I'm trying to think of one too. Well, uh, knives and forks. Remember when they tried to make the spork and that oh didn't work? That didn't work, did it? Forget the spork. I don't know. Drums, like musical instruments, seem pretty you know, maybe the reach the peak of the design. A lot of the things I like, a lot of the sports I like, the technology and the equipment of my sports is always evolving and improving. So that isn't, I don't think, reached its pinnacle. Um, do you know what, though? The best, oldest technology of all and the reason why we're here. Here, listen, listen to the sound. Those are pages well, with words he, on them. He does, yeah, books, but he does even in this chapter, he talks about like the demise of the paper book and how in the future books will be immersive, interactive. Let's, yeah, let's, let's talk about that at the end because I've got some thoughts on that. But like, a, here's, here's an example of a product that doesn't need to change, nor should it ever need to change is a number two pencil that you sharpen. I love them. Yeah, well, exactly, I love yeah. them. Um, just, just, I'm going to highlight just going back to what you're saying. Please. Um, it is the distributors who are the real customers, not the people who eventually buy the product in stores and use it in their homes. And I thought that sentence is just kind of hidden away. And I thought that was a very astute quest, um, statement. Yeah. Speaking of listening to the universe, Mark, I had that listed as my next thing to highlight for a number of reasons. Yeah. Um, no, it's really fascinating. I learned this early on, actually, in my in my career when I was transitioning. I was kind of doing music stuff, but I was also working in the tech world. I got hired by a distributor of uh, network cabling products. So like the little cables that make the internet go. And that's what I started, little jacks and patch panels and, and, and cords and all that. Right. And it was my first experience in like what distribution was. So this company sold 
every kind of cable, every kind of jack, every kind of patch panel and rack and all of that stuff. But the people that use the end result are people in office buildings that just want to turn their computer on. And they don't give eight shits what kind of patch panel <laughs> or jack is incorporated with all of that. But, you know, so those companies who sell the cable sell to the distributors. They don't sell like they don't go to like an office manager and be like, hey, well, sometimes they did and it never worked. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I thought that was a very, very cool highlight and call out. And, and what you're saying as well, that applies to cables, but it, that applies to film, music, entertainment. Like, you, you know, you're not selling the film to the person sitting in the cinema. You're selling the, to the film to the distributors and the same with music. You're selling the, 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 the albums to the distributors. One pushback on that, though, is with art, and he speaks about art, but traditionally I think that NFTs and some of these Web3 technologies are removing the traditional distribution channels. So perhaps making, especially for digital art, you know, the audience decides, not the distributors decides what is good, what is valuable, what is expensive to some degree. So there is, you know, there is hope. Here's my here's my thought on the the why adoption is taking so long. It's it's primarily that like yeah. distribution helps things scale, right? Platforms help things scale like a giant, you know, Amazon warehouse helps you scale your knitting business. If you're knitting socks, right, it helps you scale. Web3 is the opposite of that in a way, right? So yeah. that's why it's taken longer to build build those systems. We could rabbit hole that for nine years. Yeah, let's not do that. We've, we've um, that. One. All right. So another line I, 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 or another uh, sentence I underlined, most products have a development cycle of one to two years. That was interesting yeah. to read because I never really, I mean, I always thought like it took a long time to develop a really good product and, and do one that's aligned with the market. Um, how did that land with your expectations? Um, I, I highlighted the bit about video conferencing. Uh, video conferencing finally started to become common in the early 2010s. Extremely expensive video conferencing suites have been set up in businesses and universities. The best commercial systems make it seem as if you're in the room with the distant participants using high quality transmission of images, blah, 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 blah. This is 140 years from the first published conception, 90 years since the first practical demonstration, and 80 years since the first commercial release. So, yeah, um, some products do it takes a long time there's a lot of paperwork there's a lot of people talking shit there's a lot of departments that things need to go through a lot of inter interpartmental arguing and ego you know i'm not surprised it takes so long well that's when the technology is there you're talking about from like tech just being an idea to being tested in a lab to being applied to a business and then you know from there applying it to someone who wants to buy something from somebody yeah i had written down 20 years, as far as tech, emerging tech that would power a product, 20 years from lab to commercial, and then 10 to 20 years from first release to adoption, which is, and this is just for, for like technolog technological shifts, like the one you're talking about. Okay, question for you on that then, Jeremy. He speaks about, um, cult well, I've written, culture can change on dramatic shifts technology can now do this too ai so with what's happening with ai these th things won't take two years like we're shrinking the timeline from two years to two weeks days minutes even where a ai can produce what we've tried to do in years in literally minutes and i think that um that adoption of new ideas and new technologies and new ways to to create things might not be as long as it once was well We're i think shrinking AI, the window i think ai can shorten the cycle of things right but I, I i don't think ai can solve the problem of i have an idea and here's the here's pointing it to the exact market that would scale the idea in less time i mean it can it can it can help with some efficiencies i think but you know i don't that's the problem that human brains have to solve is like, why should Mark give, you know, eight shits about, you know, this, this music product that I'm building? Well, because a music product is rooted in, you know, heavy metal guitar playing and, you know, uh, some other intersection that you love, right? Because I know that's who you are. Um, 
Yeah, I don't think AI can help us get the bits, bits and pieces, help us stir these little pots yeah. quicker, but the big pot still needs more careful uh, human attendance. Oh, I love your optimism. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm at, for, for, yeah, by the way, yeah, my optimism. So I'm going to be the guy that's going to have like the underground cave with velvet curtains and record players and books when everyone's like above on the streets, like running around with all their devices on. And I'm going to charge like 10 bucks to come to the vinyl cave and uh, <laughs> have a conversation with a human. You know, that'll be, that'll be my new business. A mighty fine business. Um, human cultures change somewhat more rapidly over periods measured in decades or centuries. Microcultures, such as the way by which teenagers differ from adults, can change in a generation. What this means is that although technology is continually introducing new means of doing things, people are resistant to change in the ways that they do things. The more things change, the more they are the same. Um, I could read the French if you want, like plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Do you agree with that? The more things change, the more they stay the same. Yeah. Uh, the similar sentence that I that I enjoyed out of out of this chapter was like, technology is always going to change. People are going to be the same. In just how we approach until things. The, until they're the superhumans who've been augmented and biohacked to death. That's right. And then our next book, Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish, I've already peeked ahead at that one. And like there there are things and reasons why humans act certain certain ways. It has to do with ego and it has to do with status and hierarchies that we're going to get into next time. But um, yeah, I think I think uh, I think humans are always going to be humans until, like you said, we're somehow augmented and have hit the singularity. And, and then hopefully I'm somewhere far, far away doing uh, something far different i don't know that scares me a little bit bring it on yeah bring on our robotic overlords i am ready okay all right well i'll yeah i'll i'll be in the spot where uh humans still talk to humans and then i'll check in with you and see how things go like through a little portal or something I, i'm i'm bipolar i want to be between the two i want to experience both like it's like i love the city i love the countryside i love the heat i love the cold i want to experience both Sounds like you're just primarily undecided, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? Like, actually, about 20 years ago, um, I, I was living with this in, in Paris, and this guy made artwork of people's faces, and like, it would divide their face into their characteristics, and basically you tell him what your, what your personality is. And I actually put undecided, and I still haven't... Uh, Decided That's interesting. Well, so undecided is, I, I don't think I could, I could talk about that for a while. I think undecided is a willingness to always uh, be open to new information, right? Because the truth is only the truth locked into a matter and in, into a, into a, into a, a piece of time, right? Um, think of this analogy. Like if you got a tree that's outside your front window, right? And you know, in the springtime you go, Hey, Jeremy, these leaves are green. And like months later in November, you know, I'm like, those leaves aren't green. They're brown now, Mark, but they're still the same leaves you were talking about. Right. I like it. I like um, it. one, one thing I, one thing I rolled into before we go too deep and, uh, start, start getting into hippie language. Um, <laughs> this idea of simplification through subtraction. It's just a common theme that I just I, I kind of live by a little bit. You know, it's not one of my main uh, main things, but it's a, it's definitely a theme. So why don't why don't product teams have groups that their job is to always be the equalizer and meaning equalizer? This is another music reference. Right. So when when you're EQing a mix, meaning uh, highlighting certain frequencies and taking certain frequencies out it's always subtractive that makes the biggest difference, right? Yeah. So if you have a kick drum and a bass guitar that are both living in, whoa, your lighting just got really funky. Um, a, a kick drum and a bass guitar living in the same frequency, if you highlight one or you, you take out one frequency, it's gonna let one of those instruments breathe better than the other, right? So it's always a subtractive process. So why isn't there like a, uh, head of subtraction on the product team. I think that would be a great position to have. 
designed by minimal minimalism yeah i um i i guess i don't know the answer to that did, did would you say that steve jobs was kind of a proponent of taking away things that aren't necessary um i guess it's much much easier to add than it is to subtract um and it's I, even I, harder to integrate yeah i mean i'm sure there's some psycholo psychological reasoning like humans you know people can't throw stuff away they just hoard hoard and collect and collect and collect and the houses just become full of meaningless crap that they don't use because it's difficult to to take things away from your life and i guess that same drive applies to design um there's a biological yeah. there's a biological pull in there and i'll tell you this i'm not going to go too deep into this but i did an experiment a minimalist experiment uh for 30 days right. and this was a few years ago and like the first day i would have to give away one thing the second day two things the third day three things and by give it away it was either recycle it throw it away take it to goodwill give it to a buddy sell it whatever it is but i had to do it and at the end of a month it was like 400 something things whoa and there were certain things I remember putting out, I put it out in the garage and there were certain things I would put out in the garage that, you know, I, once I put them out there, okay, I'm, I'm done. I'm good. That's going away tomorrow. I would go back inside and I was physically drawn to go back in the garage and be like, man, I, I can't let that go yet. And a lot of it was something that someone had given me. It was hard to release that. Okay. So you had that emotional attachment to it to the memory of the person maybe it's, yeah so it's not even the, the thing more maybe it's the person and your relationship with that person um guess what else is emotionally attached uh your head your ideas your ideas yeah, so okay. apply that to business you're a product manager it's your idea to do a certain thing and i say mark that's not going to work you're attached to it and it's harder to harder to subtract it. So there's, we'll talk about more about all this in the next book, but the uh, next book. Yeah. Clear thinking. Yeah. Join us for that one. Um, there's, so we're 20 minutes in, let's do a, a, a review of the whole book. Like what did you take from it more than anything else, Jeremy? And how would you like to leave us to thinking about this book? What I did, I took away that there's, there's a, there is definitely a process to designing something that's meaningful, right? And designing something that is, uh, that does two things. Number one is something that, that someone needs, but also something that someone has the capabilities to understand and use that can create that conceptual map for that thing, uh, that they, that they need or, and then the needs and wants are a little bit different, but I think it's th those things, those things stood out. I mean, um, I'll, I will probably look back on some of these frameworks as I build things, as I, um, you know, make things for, for my projects and my companies. Yeah. Yep. Okay. What about you? For me? So the, the big things I remember are the start of the book when it gave me a, a framework for looking at how design gets from a into my living room and what is good design i, I liked all the stuff about messaging and mapping and uh, restraints and um what was it what was the one about um signifiers oh, signifiers yeah i really like that the the human centered design building your design around though he gave many examples my favorite was joy so the the thing that you're designing if it brings joy to the end user, then it's a success because if they enjoy it, if it gives them an emotional feeling, they're going to keep using it. They're going to go back to it. So I think that kind of the joy designing for joy was um, another one. But my overriding, I want to leave this book kind of with the conversation that we just had about minimalism and taking away and subtraction. I think it reflects where we are um, for all designers, take note of what I'm about to say, uh, page 290. But why purchase a new computer when the old one is functioning perfectly well? Why buy a new cooktop or refrigerator, a new phone or a camera? 
Do we really need the ice cube dispenser in the door of the refrigerator, the display screen on the oven door, the navigation system that uses three-dimensional images? What is the cost to the environment for all the materials and energy used to manufacture the new products, product, products, to say nothing of the problems of disposing safely of the old? The design of everyday things is in great danger of becoming the design of superfluous, overloaded, unnecessary things. So design less, but design better. I love that. That's, yeah, that's big, dude. That's big. That's because why we it do takes... the book club. That's great. And hey, one, so uh, I don't know if you saw this in the book, but Socrates actually yes. is a giant promoter of uh, the Thinking on Paper book club. Um, let me, let me, let me read you this. It's kind of Please coming, do. coming back in retrograde here. When a person tells you something, you can question the statement, discuss it and debate it thereby enhancing the material and the understanding with a book. Well, what can you do? You can't argue back. I beg to differ, my friend. You can't yes, argue Socrates. back. You're, yes, so, Socrates. You can argue back because that's what we do every week. We get to push back on each other's thinking, sharpen our skills, question our perspectives. Um, and I'm grateful to be able to do it, man. Yep. So am I. And so is the audience. If this is your kind of bag, buy Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish. Go to thinkingonpaper.xyz. Subscribe, like, and come and join us. And we can... Um, We'll let Socrates be. We're not going to take him on, but we can. And watch this. We'll do a quick demonstration of what it'll look like to be on the show. Uh, so if we're here debating like this and we're talking about the book, uh, Mark's reading the book. Hey, Mark, come jump in a square and uh, enjoy the participation. I think we'll have a few next week, if I'm not mistaken. Fingers crossed. Stay curious. Be disruptive. Keep thinking on paper. See you next time, guys. Bye.